Welcome to the Empowered Wife Podcast, where it's all about fixing your relationship without your man's conscious effort so that you feel desired and taken care of and special, even if your relationship feels completely hopeless. I'm Laura Doyle, and today I'm sharing the number one way to make your marriage happier. My guest, Suzanne, was having a lot of anxiety about her marriage, and she bristled every time her husband said, you're not going to control me. When she decided to make some changes, he responded with suspicion. But then the atmosphere in her house changed and became less defensive and more calm. She's going to tell us how she made her home peaceful. And then I'll be giving out the Worst Relationship Advice of the Week Award, which came to one of my students through a well-meaning friend. You'll hear from her why this advice was absolutely terrible. All that is coming up. But first, let's talk about the number one way to make your marriage happier. A student, Shauna, was upset with her husband when she got home to find the kids eating candy and playing on the iPad while he worked in the yard. I just can never count on him when I want to go out, she said. He says he's taking care of the kids and then I come home to this. Meanwhile, another student, Jessica, was just as upset with her husband, who moved the computer and a huge pile of cords into their bedroom, making it look messy. Why can't he understand that I like things to be tidy and organized, she complained. And another student, Karen, was equally irritated about her husband coming home from work an hour later than he said he would. He always does this, she told me. I'm just going to tell him how inconsiderate he is. Of course, it's easy to see ways that each of those husbands had been irritating or irresponsible. But it turns out that wasn't the real problem. In each of these cases, there was something else contributing to the tension in the relationship, and it had everything to do with Shauna, Jessica, and Karen. It just wasn't obvious to them at first, not until I asked them this revealing question. What have you done recently to make yourself happy? Well, I was sick and we had house guests, Shauna admitted. So I've been running ragged lately. I guess that's why he's getting on my nerves so much lately. I'm just out of patience at this moment. I need a break. And Jessica said almost the same thing. I've been having to work more because of a change in my department. And I haven't had time to do anything for myself, she told me. Karen had just moved and was so busy trying to get everything put right in the new house that she felt she just couldn't relax. I know I'm exhausted, but I just can't stop when I know there are still boxes to unpack, she said. Sometimes life gets busy, or you don't get sleep, or it's way past time to eat, or your kid doesn't go to school, and your day gets thrown off. That's the time your husband is most likely to seem annoying, and he may be. Sometimes husbands do things that drive you crazy. They can exercise their right to be wrong at the wrong time. And that can be irritating. Unless you just had the best time talking to your girlfriend on the phone, or you just went for a walk on an unseasonably warm day, or you had coffee and a scone while playing on your phone, or window shopped at your favorite store for 20 minutes, and that filled you up. None of those activities will change your situation. True. You may still be unhappy that the kids only had nerds candy for breakfast or that there's an ugly computer in your bedroom or that your husband was late coming home again. But here's the big difference. If you've just made yourself happy by investing the time and energy to delight yourself, you're more likely to laugh at the situation instead of wanting to scream. You're also going to be able to avoid creating another problem, a conflict in your relationship. Actively replenishing my spirit by doing at least three things a day for my own happiness is like insurance. It protects me from feeling so afraid that I say something snippy or sarcastic or roll my eyes. That's not the wife or woman I want to be. It's also insurance against the familiar thoughts that swirl around in my overextended head, like... I am so much smarter. I am so much more efficient. I am so much more practical than he is. That kind of thinking always left me feeling lonely and overwhelmed. But with the so happy I can't stop smiling feeling I give myself every day now, I'm not even tempted to go there. I'm empowered to choose the dignified, vulnerable, respectful approach most of the time. And then my husband responds to me better. In order to have a happy relationship, You have to make yourself happy first. This is what Oprah meant when she said, remember your spirit. So I make it a priority to 
play volleyball, talk to my friends, play games on my phone, take naps, and do work that I love. Because the happier I am, the happier my marriage is. And it all starts with replenishing my spirit with self-care every day. If you're wondering how to get started with fixing your relationship and making it shiny again, then you need a roadmap. Get six simple steps to follow that will set your relationship up for success. Discover three common mistakes that wives make trying to fix their relationship that just make things worse. When you download my free Adored Wife Roadmap, you can do that at GetCherished.com. Go to GetCherished.com now to get your roadmap in minutes. My guest, Suzanne, was having a lot of anxiety about her marriage and bristled every time her husband said, you're not going to control me. When she decided to make some changes, he responded with suspicion. But then the atmosphere in her house changed and became less defensive and more calm. She's going to tell us how she made her home more peaceful. Suzanne, welcome to the Empowered Wife podcast. Thanks for being on today. You're very welcome. Thank you for having me. So take us back to the bad old days. What was going on in your marriage that was so unpleasant? It was a cold war. We would fight and he would, and in my heart, my deepest heart was he did not know who I was. He had no idea who I was. And I was always battling to get him to see me. Wow. So he didn't see you. So you would say things and he would take it the wrong way or what is that? So really painful, really lonely, it sounds Mm -hmm. like. And and, uh, what kinds of things were you fighting about? We would fight about him um, spending time at work and just working more than normal. We would fight about just doing things that I would like to do. He liked to do what he wanted to do and only what he wanted to do. And um, those are the biggest things, just not being connected. I I wanted to be connected so bad. I just wanted to be connected to him. And he did not want to be connected to me. So it sounds like he was also a little distant, maybe kind of making work the priority and not caring much about your happiness. Correct. So true. Okay. And And so what were you wanting him to do differently? around work, for example? Um, His workplace at the time, well, one of his clients at the time was not a good person. The environment was a horrible environment and it just was so much room for anything to make it blunt. It was almost like a, a frat house. So he spent a lot of time there and it bothered me so much. And I just wanted him to see what I saw. I wanted him to um, feel how I felt looking at the environment from the outside in, and he could not, or he would not. I don't think it was a, I think it was a choice. He just would not see it. So this was probably crazy making, because you're saying, look, I see what I see. And he was dismissing it. It sounds Mm -hmm. like, and not listening to you. Mm -hmm. And then uh, and then every so often he would be mad at you for controlling him. It sounds like. Absolutely. Absolutely. It, every time I tried to explain it to him or express how I felt, I was either emotional or controlling. You're being emotional for nothing and you're trying to control me. And his thing was, you will not control me. And what do you do with that? Besides, now I'm going to fight you to control me, to control the situation rather. If you're telling me I can't control you, now, now we're going to fight because I have to control you because now I have to go. I have to protect my heart. That's how I felt. I was trying to protect my heart. And what kinds of things were you doing to protect yourself? Um, I would, in the beginning, I would act as though it didn't bother me. I would pretend as though I didn't see what I saw or I didn't have the feelings that I felt about certain people in that environment. And um, eventually it got hard to not see or to not say what I saw. So I started to try and get him to engage in conversations about what it was and what I thought I saw to confirm it for me. So because I didn't want to just be blaming people, you know, and, and saying these people are this way or that way. So I, I started trying to talk to him about it. And when I started talking to him about it, then it became 
my issue. And then when I tried to get out of it being my issue, I just got plain mad, you know, and I would call it what it was. And um, even if I was wrong, I would call it what I thought it was. And he um, it just became a vicious battle, a, a vicious battle. He, and, and it was just really mad. And so you were kind of in your respective corners, it sounds like, when you mm-hmm. talk about this Cold War and just kind of did it kind of devolve into a roommate situation or was the passion always pretty good? We always had great passion um, that that never, ever um, fell to the wayside. If this was one of those things where I saw danger, it was almost like danger, danger, danger. And he was being fed, you know, the e- his ego was being fed. So he was cool with it. Even though the red flags were up, he was OK with the red flags because he was being fed, you know, certain egotistical moments, you know, being in the, being in the environment because he was the all knowing and wise one in the group and, and everybody, he was being oohed and odd over. So it was, I'm sure it was difficult for him, you know, to leave that environment and come home and I'm looking at him and I'm telling him the truth, but he didn't want to receive it or even admit to it. And um, to just come home to me bickering and, and acting crazy. Because I was crazy. You were crazy. Well, but to be fair, you probably were having, I can see why you'd be so anxious when you describe a frat house kind of Mm -hmm. environment. There's a lot of unwholesome things that a wife doesn't want her husband to be engaging in Mm -hmm. that go on in a frat house. And so it sounds like those were um, some of your fears that were coming up. Mm -hmm. And then to either be told you're too emotional or you're too controlling kind of leaves you no way out, right? Yeah. To have that yeah. conversation. Yeah. So, um, so what happened? Um, I finally got to a place where I knew I could not change it with any beautiful word, any ugly word. I couldn't change it in any deed. There's nothing I could do. There's nothing I could say. There was nothing about me that was going to change that situation. And I gave up complete control, completely. I I was done talking about it. I was done fighting about it. I was done trying to get him to see what I saw. I was done with the conversation altogether. And I started working on myself. I literally, um, it was, it was one of those moments where we were actually in counseling and, um, it was just me and my husband and another guy. And, um, so, and I picked a guy counselor, so he would feel comfortable. And, and the guy counselor was, I mean, he he literally told me, I'm going to have to be OK with the choices that my husband makes, even if it is an unwholesome situation. He literally told me that. And, and, and I just sat there and I was like. Amazed. And I think that was the day that I gave up on marriage counseling. I was like, this this could have been the worst thing that I ever did, because if he told because he told me that to decide. I don't know what he told my husband. He might have told my husband, you know, that he understood or gave him, you know, room to continue with the behavior. And and it just floored me. So I sat there and it was almost like an out-of-body experience. And I just went into a place and, and I just started playing back the entire 20 plus years of my marriage in my head while they were talking in front of me in this counseling session. And I saw myself and it was almost like I saw myself in the mirror and I started to question who was I? Who was I bringing to the environment? Why was he enjoying that environment more than the one that we were creating as a family? And, and what I saw, I did not like. It was not an environment that I would want to come home to after being hooed and hot over and felt like you're the best thing since sliced bread. And, and then I wouldn't want to walk into that environment. So And, and I cried an ugly cry right in front of them. And they thought I was crying because of a counseling session. No, I was crying because I had tapped into my true self, who I really was in that moment. And I wanted, and and I didn't want to be her anymore. And, And from that day on, I started the journey of letting go of what I could not change and working on myself completely from the inside out. And that's how I found, when I ended up finding your book a couple of years later, and it just made a whole lot of sense to me at that point. And I started putting little things into practice and trying to walk out the skills. And eventually he started looking at me different, you know, and he started 
trying to um, figure out what was going on. He was like, it's way too quiet. And, and I know you're faking. Like he really literally told me you faking, you'll change in a minute. And I never did. I never did. So you have this incredible moment of conviction mm-hmm. of really seeing some of the behaviors that you yeah. you didn't like about yourself. I remember that moment too. It was a very painful moment. Yeah. Right? It's, it's incredibly painful. And yet it's actually the start of empowerment. And it sounds like that's what it was for you. And so what what did you first start doing differently that had your husband saying, oh, you're you're faking it? I started being quiet, just simply not saying anything. Like I remember um, I had a whole lot of like really deep moments. We were sitting on the couch and um, he had just came home from work. And um, so we were sitting watching TV and I was in my feelings. I was I was just deeply hurt because we were sitting on the couch, not saying nothing to each other. And it's just the two of us in the house. And I wanted to be emotional. I wanted to explain to him what was going on in my heart, and my head. And I did not let one single tear fall. I cried on the inside, though. I kept it in. And what I learned in that, I mean, I literally cried, cried on the inside, but I did not let a tear fall. And what I learned is I don't have to be overly emotional and I don't have to pour all of that and dump it on him when he really probably doesn't even know what to do with it. You know, and I know after being with him for so long, I can overwhelm him because I am an orator. I'm an emotional woman. And if I give it to him for real, he's going to fall apart. He will not manage it well. And so I, and after that moment, when I realized I don't have to say everything that I want to say, I don't have to feel all of this. If I choose not to, I can turn those emotions into something else. And, and I started walking it out by when, when I get anxiety and I start to get ready to go into that whole overload of emotion, I figure it out. And I'll ask myself, what is this? You know, I I have real blown, really true conversations with myself. And I I figure it out. I walk it back to the core. And I give myself at least two or three days before I bring it up. And nine times out of 10, in those two or three days, it's not even worthy of a conversation. You don't want to bring it up anymore. Mm -mm. Sounds like. Mm -mm. So, So what I hear you saying is you're really able to stop in a moment that feels super urgent. Like, I think I, I know for me, like some of the, like, I got to say this or I'm going to explode. I've had that feeling before. And you're able to pause and have a conversation with yourself mm-hmm. so that you're not showing up in a way that is, um, I guess I want to say kind of out of control. Is that mm-hmm. fair to say? And so, and, and then by the time you do bring it up, if you bring it up in a couple of days, it's probably much more dignified and calm. Mm-hmm. And you've kind of refined your message to yeah. what you really want to say. So uh, so this sounds like this is one way to make sure you're not saying things that are um, critical or hurtful mm-hmm. kind of in the heat of the moment. Is that fair to say? Absolutely. So this has to have improved the emotional safety at your house. Big time. I mean, when I say big time, I, I mean, it is, I'm on the side now where he's exhibiting the skills in our relationship, like he pause, take he he allows himself great pauses before he speaks, um, and it amazes me every single time. And if I say something that is disrespectful, he 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 literally will rephrase it so that I hear him and understand, and then I can respond and apologize in the moment. It's 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 working out so that we're both showing each other so much respect. Mm-hmm. And and it's all I ever really wanted is for him to see me and to respect the woman that I am. Because I think I'm pretty cool. I think I'm pretty smart. And I think I bring a lot to the table. And all I really wanted was him to see those things in me and honor it. And he he pretty he I can say today that he does. Wow. Yeah, because that was a big theme of the hurt was that he didn't see you. And yeah. So it sounds like by, so it's a kind of a maturity in a way that you're describing, I think, right? Like in a way, like a two-year-old, when they want something, they just go, Wah! right? And then as we, as we grow older, I know, I know for me, it was also a tendency to 
I'll say use waterworks. Unfortunately, I'm not proud of it, but, uh, and maybe it wasn't super intentional, but I just didn't think I had a choice, right? Like I'm so upset right now. This is all I can bring. Mm -hmm. And your experience really kind of demonstrates that it is a choice Mm -hmm. how you want to show up. So, and and you created this whole culture in your home single-handedly by going first. Was that hard to get yourself to do that, to go first? Because didn't they go through your mind like, why doesn't he have to do something? For me, it was not. For me, it was not because I was always seeking. I, 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 I was seeking and I had made the decision that I wanted him. I mean, I, I wanted him. Even if he didn't change anything, I still wanted him. So for me, it wasn't it wasn't a struggle to to put the work in first because and also, I made the the choice to, and I I actually told my husband this earlier on when he was still suspicious of this new person. I told him I will be her, the person that you see, with or without you, but I want to be her with you. And he did not speak for about fifteen minutes because it shocked him. And I meant it. I didn't mean it to be hurtful. I didn't mean it to do anything other than let him, um, this is who I will be. Me. So you're, you're wanting him to see the changes. Yeah. It sounds like too, right? And to take yeah. it seriously, not to just blow it off. Yeah. So what what is your relationship like now? It is so, it's different. It's very mature. That was a proper word. We've grown older um, because we got married at 18 and 19. We had to go through the twenties. We had to, you know, go through all of those adjustments, and we raised kids, and now we're empty nesters. Um, I think we're settling down in age, and and we're also settling down mentally, emotionally. But as far as relationally, we are having so much fun. I mean, just the little things. Like yesterday, we literally woke up, had a cup of coffee, and went for a drive. Little things are are such a big deal to us these days. And and they always were a big deal to me. He was always trying to work and make money and and buy these big things. But for me, it was always the little bitty things that mattered. And it's like the little things are the things that keep us grounded today. And and it's it's such a good we still fight. We still have issues, but they we we handle them so much different, but just so much different. Yeah. And that is where intimacy happens, right? In those little moments over that cup of coffee or uh, going for a drive. It can actually be a really unpleasant experience mm-hmm. if there's not good connection in the car, right? It could be a kind of a silent experience. So it sounds like there's enough, there's a, there's warmth and connection. So, so it's enjoyable. So what, so what else have you done that Besides, so I, and I love this piece that you shared about just really making a choice of how you're going to show up in the conversations with him. What else would you say has helped um, create the kind of peace, which I hear is not perfect, of course, no marriage is perfect. Mm-hmm. But what else uh, would you say? The thing that um, I can, without a doubt, say is the, the catalyst to peace in my home is when I took complete ownership of me. And when I decided that who I am, who I'm to become, all of my dreams, all of my desires, they were my responsibility and not his. Um, it, it changed my entire life, not just with my husband, but with my kids, friendships, everything. Um, I, I stopped being so focused on external things as much. And I, I just started a journey of, of digging deeper within me. Um, looking at the ugly, the good, all of it, and and really striving to figure myself out. I think that's that's the thing that caused the environment to shift and stay shifted because I was no longer worrying him to death about what he had on his his agenda. His agenda was his. From that point on, every now and then I'll get confused and and pick up something that wasn't mine. Like I think I shared in. Um, a, a bit back, um, how I found myself having to cook breakfast every day. Yeah. And, and that was because I was all over there doing stuff I wasn't supposed to do, but I got out of it. Thank God, because I did not want to cook breakfast every day. And, um, but I focused very hard on just controlling the environment that I have control over. And I leave the rest up to 
whoever's responsible for it. And if they ask me for my help, I'll help them. And, and, and my, because my struggle is not getting overly involved. I'll help when you don't want help. And I'll give you advice when you don't want advice. And I like my advice. So I give you a bunch of it. And right. so I had to, I have, I've had to manage me. And, and I think, and here's something that I like to say in, in my circle is I'm on the journey of mastering my own position, whatever that is. I choose to, if, if I'm in the yard gardening, I choose to master that. If I'm in the house sweeping, I'm going to master sweeping. If I'm, if I'm getting myself all dolled up for a date, I'm going to be the best date you ever had. So it's just all about me trying to be my best self in everything that I do. Yeah. And- Beautiful. So what's a tip you'd give to a woman who's feeling like she's in that cold war where she doesn't feel seen and she doesn't feel like she has any influence because her husband is dismissing and saying, you're too emotional, you're too controlling. What would you, where would you suggest she start to kind of, to create the kind of relationship where you get up yesterday and have a cup of coffee and go for a drive together because you're enjoying each other's company? I had to master saying yes. I would not even allow my husband to feed me food if we were out to dinner. I don't know where I got it from. I would would be like, no, thank you. As though it was gracious. No, thank you. But I started saying yes to stuff that I didn't even like in order to create space for me to be in his world. In my life, he had a brick wall erected between us. And that's the best way I can describe it. It was up, it was solidified, it was shirt up on every corner. And there was nothing I could do except lay at the floor of that wall and wait for an opening. And when I got an opening, I said, yes. I I mean, I don't care what it was. I said, yes. He he worked out um, all the time and he invited me to go work out. I didn't want to go, but I bought the most cute workout outfits I could find. And I was in the gym with him and I lost 40 pounds going back since the pandemic but I was in the gym with him I said yes to everything every single thing yes and I would just go and I would be quiet and I would just be in his presence and then eventually we started talking again and we became friends again and our life became everything that I wanted it to be now we we hang out we laugh and we talk and he he comes home and now he tells me about his day because I, 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 I literally, I literally had to lay at the foot of that brick wall for about two solid years. Wow. Two solid years. And so how did you get yourself to do that? At some point, didn't you think, well, this isn't worth it or he's never going to come around or. I still think he, every now and then when he get on my nerves, I still think this dude ain't going to never change. You know, I'll go there in my mind, but my, I wanted him. I wanted them. And you were really clear about that. You got I very clear. I wanted them. Yeah. I think, I think it's, so you're not a fence sitter, right? I think a lot of students I talk to, they'll say, I don't know if this is worth it, but you never had that conversation with mm-hmm. yourself. You always felt that this was worth it. And so even though you were suffering, you were able to kind of hold on to that long-term vision that you were going to get this back and have it. So even though two years is a long time to sit outside of a brick wall. Yeah. And you know, I used to tell myself um, all the time, I'm doing this. I used to think back in the years, I I went and now today, I know that I started the process in pride. I was going to get him because I could. If I kept him, I don't care. I'm just going to get him because I can't. And in that, I, but I knew I wanted him, but it was so much ego and so much pride behind it. That's why I'm so grateful that I found the skills because I was doing things because the way the world and our environment says you do things. But when I found the skills, there was a little bit of, of what's the proper word? There was a little bit of grace in the skills. And I think that was the piece that I needed to connect. No, it's not about ego. You love your husband. And you really want your husband. You don't want him just because you can get him. You want him because he's your husband and you love him. And I think that's the thing that really turned the page for me because that grace that comes through when you're, when, when you forget about everything else and you begin to develop the skills within you and you can be, you can, you can just 
respectfully lay at the feet of that 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 brick wall and and wait patiently, quietly, and until that moment when when you can just open up that little crack and say yes, just simply yes. And and I, I know that was the thing the case for me. I was very egotistical. I was very you know, I was I was going to do it just because I could type mindset. And in the process, I learned so much about myself. I learned that I am I am super feminine. I love to be treated like a lady and I love to treat him like a man. I like when he's big and burly and in control and and just a, a wild animal. I like that about him, you know, and, and I and I reserve room for him to be just that in my life. And even when it gets on my nerves, I've learned to just. You know, this is the thing that I love about him. So why now am I going to allow that to cause me to be all out of sorts? So I, I manage me. I try to manage me through it. Yeah. And I think I hear you saying, too, like this two years of being outside the brick wall was not. Um, I think it, it, because you talked about the empowerment that you felt from really being managing your own position that you talked about, that this was like some of the wreckage, some of the consequence of of what Suzanne had been bringing to the relationship previously. For sure. So that's your, that's your beautiful accountability. Mm-hmm. What would you say to yourself if you could go back and knowing what you know now, what would you say to yourself? I would tell myself to love unconditionally without conditions, just love, give it all you got. And it will produce good fruit. And in that off chance that it does not, you were authentic. You weren't putting up gates and walls. Just be free to love authentically. And I did, I know I did not because I didn't know how to. I was a kid, you know? And um, so I would encourage my younger self to love hard and to love authentically. Beautiful. And Suzanne, um, because you were married so young, that I mean, you guys have beat the odds. There's terrible odds, right, for yeah. people that get married young and you're not in that camp. Like you have now created, um, sounds like a beautiful marriage, beautiful family. And it, it takes enormous strength. I think sometimes you hear those messages, even just is that I'm sure it's something you've heard before. Right. That, that, time, yeah. Right. Yeah. Right. So, so you had these messages like, oh, you guys are probably not going to make it. And mm-hmm. yet uh, you really did. So I have so much admiration that you did mature yeah. and figure that all out. It sounds uh, kind of miraculous, honestly, mm-hmm. uh, which you've done. But I but I give you all the credit mm-hmm. for making the decisions that led to that. So, mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for sharing your inspiring story with all of us about, um, you know, these, these very personal matters uh, inside your marriage. What has you be willing to come on and, and talk about these things? Um, I did it because we, it is an, we are an anomaly. We should not have survived it. We shouldn't. We shouldn't have. My husband and I, we come from polar opposites of the world. We were brought up different. And just so happened, an 18 year old and a 19 year old decided to get married. And he didn't have any idea what a husband was. I didn't have any idea what a wife was. And we pretended for so, so long to do it the way we thought it was supposed to be done. So I think it's just my story is one that can, if it can encourage one couple to just hang in there. And see what's on the other side of the struggle and the pain. It's so worth it. It is just so worth it to just see who he becomes. And one thing I will add, and I want to keep it long, but the moment I started walking in this new journey of discovering me, I opened up room to discover him. And he was amazing. When I took the lens of this guy that I had worked up in my mind off, and I started looking at him. I started to appreciate so much that I didn't even know was there because we think so differently. He was able to teach me. Even when I thought I wasn't, he couldn't teach me anything. The fact that I allowed myself to discover me, it made room for me to also discover him. And it was the most amazing thing to see him through a new light. He's a good guy. He is. Wow. So you're saying this... Uh... This love thing, this marriage thing, it really is all it's cracked up to be. It really, really is. <laughs> it truly is. Amen. It's Amen. always changing. 
It's something new all the time. And and there there's just no other relationship like this marriage relationship. He knows me when I'm ugly. He knows me when I'm sad. He knows me when I'm put together. He just knows me. And, and there's nobody else quite on this earth that I can say knows me like my husband does. Yeah, it sounds like it's a source of uh, a lot of inner strength. Mm-hmm. Big time. Uh, well, I think you have encouraged another couple uh, today, at least one, <laughs> but probably many. Thank <laughs> so thank you so much. Suzanne, this has been wonderful. Thank you for having me. It has been great. If you're wondering how to get started with fixing your relationship and making it shiny again, then you need a roadmap. Get six simple steps to follow that will set your relationship up for success. Discover three common mistakes that wives make trying to fix their relationship that just make things worse. When you download my free Adored Wife Roadmap, you can do that at getcherished.com. Go to getcherished.com now to get your roadmap in minutes. And now it's time for the Worst Relationship Advice of the Week Award. It's the Worst Relationship Advice of the Worst Relationship Advice. Yeah, it's the Worst Relationship Advice of the Worst Relationship Advice of the Week. And the advice that's turning my stomach this week is to prepare for the worst. A coach training student wrote in with this, and I want to give her a shout out. Thanks for contributing to the podcast with this truly terrible advice. I'm going to read exactly what she wrote because it's so insightful. She says, at wine last week, I was trying to practice self-care. My good friend and I discussed my dilemmas in my marriage, and I was explaining all the hard work I'm doing and the great things that I'm learning in my new program, and she ended with advising me this. She said, I can tell you're very dedicated to your marriage and you're really benefiting from this new empowered wife coaching, but I still need to encourage you to prepare for the worst. You may do all of this hard work and he may leave you anyway. And as your friend, I want you to prepare your heart for that so you'll be able to recover. I felt so sad after that wine night. I was looking forward to coming home lighter after spending time with a girlfriend, but she totally took the wind out of my sails. From the Empowered Wife program, I've been learning that we get back what we give. And if I showed my husband any sign that I had given up by mentally preparing for the worst, I truly knew I had no chance. But my friend's conventional wisdom did not allow her to see this point of view. She sort of seemed like she felt sorry for me because all signs are pointing to divorce based on what I've told her my husband has been saying to me. I would much rather subscribe to the spouse fulfilling prophecy uh, program rather than the harden your heart program. I need hope. Well, amen, sister. I hear you. And I am reminded of Norman Vincent Peale's wise words when he said, always see the possibility for they are always there. And one way to be a true friend is to stand for your friend's greatness, to see the possibility for her instead of sucking out the hope like a Harry Potter death eater. And for that reason, although I'm sure your friend meant well, the advice to prepare for the worst is the very worst relationship advice I've heard all week. Listen and subscribe to the Empowered Wife podcast. Next week, we'll talk about five hacks for communicating with men so they hear you and get you. In the meantime, I hope you're having lots of fun. Today's fun fact is that I like my yoga just like I like my coffee, she said, sipping her tea. (laughs) 